I like about these little hiding spots is they're great for stuff like this. The snow brush. Snow brush. You go to hell, snow brush. We'll see you next year. <laughs> there we go. Now we'll feel better. This is the 2024 Subaru Ascent. It's the first generation Subaru three row, which initially launched for model year 2019 and which more recently underwent a mid-cycle refresh last year for a bolder and more alert look. Some new tech features and an updated eyesight safety system with new camera tech and software for enhanced performance and smoothness. The Ascent is commonly compared to models like the Honda Pilot, Toyota Highlander, and Chevrolet Traverse. Pricing from $42,000 opens the door with standard symmetrical all-wheel drive and 260 horsepower from a flat four turbo. Used in all models from basic to top of the line, like my tester, the $55,000 Subaru Ascent Premier. There are five trim grades on offer, each of which can tow 5,000 pounds, and all models are built in Lafayette, Indiana. By the way, this is James, my trusty cameraman of over 15 years shooting cars together. And I'm award-winning Canadian motoring journalist and technical writer Justin Pritchard. And in some future videos, we'll be bringing you deep dives on the exact behavior of this vehicle's transmission, as well as an intensive data comparison between the 2024 Subaru Ascent and the 2024 Honda Pilot. So if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss those uploads. Now let's take a look around inside. The cabin makes a strong first impression with thick, prominent accenting and line work surrounding the front seat occupants with layers of shapes and slashes that keep the eyes busy. The color palette in here is fairly subdued and other than the big screen central infotainment system, much of the rest of the forward dash is pretty quiet looking. So shapes and contrasting layers of paneling kept my eyes busier than screens and gadgets in here. And you'll see chrome or metal trim surrounding key interfaces like the steering wheel controls, door switches and central infotainment. So closer look for you here at the vertical big screen infotainment system. So I'm using wireless Android Auto, no cord required there. Just tap here. That's gonna pop up onto the screen in a moment. So there's uh, Spotify working the exact same as I left it on my phone with all my playlists and whatnot right here. Maps, exactly the same thing. So factory interface up here, that's got your X mode and a few other functions that you can swipe through up at the top here. Down at the bottom, we've got our climate control interface here as well, uh, with some additional redundant hard buttons there, if you like. We can always just go back to uh, the home screen right here with that button. And the nice thing about having multiple interfaces and displays kind of stacked up like this is less hunting around through the menus to find the function you're looking for. Instruments are conventional analog, which tends to be my preference. The central driver computer screen between the gauges is looking a little dated these days, but it is easy to read and use nonetheless. Yeah. And while checking out the interior in a lot more detail, camera guy James and I did find some interesting and disappointingly low budget touches and a strange to operate third row folding seat, which we will be demonstrating for you in painstaking detail momentarily. But there is definitely some contrast in here between the high-end touches that you expect in a top-of-the-line SUV and a couple of low-budget touches as well. The two that stick out to me the most uh, deal with this storage notch that you can see goes across uh, the driver's side and across the passenger side there. And if we get up close, we've got this as leather lined right up into there. Nice premium touch. But then if we look at places like down here, and down here, we've got button blanks. And those are a low budget way to conceal options not fitted to this vehicle, or in the case of this tester, which is fully loaded, these aren't options that are missing. These are options that used to be manipulated from switches elsewhere and they've moved them, but rather than refinishing the entire panel, they've just popped in those button blanks again, a little bit of a low budget looking touch. And the other one is right here in the central infotainment screen I just showed you. We've got this big, bright, modern screen here. And then these tactile buttons on the outside that are just square and sort of plain. So some of the switch gear in here looking pretty out of date compared to some of the displays in here. And with that, I'll give you this comprehensive interior walk around where James and I check out virtually every nook and cranny in here. Power tailgate, of course. Let's see what's going on on the back here. I'm going to start with the spare tire, as we often do. Oh, look at that. This was your favorite feature from the, uh, yeah, the other one. Hyundai Palisade, except it, this one's... It, this one's actually loosely in there, but it is still kind of has a little place to go. I don't hear anything driving, so I don't think it's making any noise, but... Okay, so cargo cover, jack, and tools. 
So if tire's underneath. Yeah, it's just temporary on. Oh. So all your jack and gear up top, temporary spare tire underneath. It's gonna do you much better than a can of run flat if you blow a sidewall. It's like a two-step, that's weird. Yeah. See that, did you see that? Look, I got, okay, to close this, I'm gonna do this one down. Yeah. Wanna bring it back up, pull that up. This and, makes it easier. But it stops at the, like, straight up, and then you gotta, it doesn't go any further, but I have to pull this one, and then I can. Oh yeah. A little bit of a tug there. See, but that's where it stops. Oh yeah, it stops right there, you where you can't sit and it's like locked in place. You have to grab the second strap, to pull it back. There we go. So we're going to pull this while pushing at least this and far. Then you can let it go. And then down we go. To come back up, we pull this. It's going to stop us there for whatever reason. It's a really weird angle. And then pull this one to get it all the way back. Nice and flat when it folds down, though. Yeah. They've got this just to like the last millimeter of space here. Yeah, that's. Uh, so we don't close the tailgate on that. Finagle your finger in here and then push that where you see a lot of competitors where these will actually fold out of the way on their own. Fold these down. Little bit of a hump right there, just very slightly, but otherwise I'd say completely flat back here. With this, certainly not the most straightforward third row setup we've ever seen. Fairly easy, you'll get used to it in no time. Um, but I think just a little bit more complicated than, uh, than it needs to be. So front seat, in case you haven't uh, seen inside of one of these before. So five foot 10, 200 guy here in my comfortable seated driving position. I feel like I'm sitting a little deeper down into the cabin of this than I'm used to in a crossover, giving me a little bit more headroom. Uh, nothing obviously cramped or crowded here. Plenty of room for my legs to sit apart if I like. Good outward sight lines here. One thing to point out, pretty beefy kind of chunky uh, A pillars here. In some competitors, these are much thinner. These are chewing up a little bit of your outward visibility, so just bear that in mind. If you're driving around in tight quarters, an area with lots of pedestrians, you are losing a little bit of visibility out the front sides uh, because of these pretty chunky A pillars right here. Yeah, I think they're trying to accommodate by putting a little second window in there. Yeah, yeah, you've got this little extra window here and you've got this great big, remember it was the Toyota Highlander Hybrid Max where we were pretty impressed with these being about half the width. Yeah. Uh, of the A pillars that we see here in the Subaru. So just something to take note of. Yeah, plenty of space around my legs, plenty of space over the top of my head here. Nothing's feeling cramped or crowded at all. Um, almost stretch out roomy, nice sense of space in here, but also a nice sense of sitting down low and being sort of surrounded by the dash instead of up high and towering above it. Uh, easy reach here to the gigantic central screen. We've got this vertical touch screen layout here, a couple of hard buttons uh, for easy access there if we want. Some storage down here for the smartphone, couple of uh, high output USB plugs there, both varieties. We do have a couple of these low budget buttons. You can't afford to buy the premium, yeah, that's what so that is. Yeah. A lot of cars we'll, doing away with that. We'll make you think about it every time you look at it. Yeah, you wonder what feature you didn't buy. Pretty old school looking uh, button and control layout down here. This is the same dimmer switch they've been putting in Subarus for ages which is fine, it works good, it's easy. And again, another button blank right here. So a couple of little low budget touches, maybe letting this interior down a little. Not quite elbows deep, but just about. Oh, and no charging in No charging, no light in there. So no power, no lighting inside of this uh, center console storage bin. Again, another possibly lower budget touch than you're expecting. All right, so now let's go see how somebody of my size would fit uh, directly in that second row behind themselves. Very easy step in, nice low floor. In we go. At least a full hands width of uh, knee room there. Nice flat floor all the way across the back, helping open up that sense of roominess. A little bit of extra storage here, some cup holders. Yeah, some multiple cup holders in the door as well as two more down there on the floor. Additional charging uh, storage pouches on both sides, which is nice. Come in place here. A little lever here. Oh, we're all the way back. So we're definitely all really? the way back. I mean, it's adequate leg room is probably more than adequate, but this seat is all the way uh, to the rear of those tracks. If we want to squeeze it up a little bit more, give the person behind us some room, uh, we can go about this far forward. Yeah, so it's You're tight, but it's just enough leg room. It's not really generous, I'd say, but I, I'm expecting a little bit more uh, reverse travel from this seat than it's giving me, but still adequate, I would say. Ooh, that's angled quite. That's high. got quite the step up to it here. So you're not going to have a fully flat cargo area in the second row, 
Uh, we know it's basically flat uh, in the rear row and behind it, but you do have this ramp here when you've got these seats folded down. Uh, so bear that in mind, depending on the type of cargo you're bringing with you. You're about, you're maybe an inch shorter than I am, but roughly about the same size. Oh, and that's room. Yeah, you get your boots down on the amplifier there, just but about. It, but that's actually in the floor, so. You're I'm on top a, of I'm it. not even touching it. Yeah. So. You've got to pull this lever first and then pull this lever to get the back all the way down. So two levers to operate instead of one. And can we, yeah, we can actually move these when they're folded, uh, which is a nice touch too. But now you and I have to get that third row upright and see how we fit back there. And we're gonna have to go back and, right? Because this is as far up as you can get these. Yeah. Now without going around to the trunk to uh, pull oh. them back down. I can't reach that far, so. So we've, we've flipped them up from up there. Now you have to walk back here, pull this again, and pull it back. So again, just a little more complicated than it has to be. Not bad. And actually, enough room sort of coming in here that you're not hitting it with your uh, hip or your side or your butt. We do have the little hand grabs there if we like. They work from the outside, giving you uh, some grip to get in. All right, so as a five foot 10 guy, I'm just about out of space. My legs are sitting up higher back here. So my knees are kind of up like this instead of sitting flat. I wouldn't say it's terribly uncomfortable, but definitely this is gonna be best left uh, for your smallest passengers. Yeah, I'm pretty much out of headroom if I'm leaning back here. I can kind of slouch down and just make it fit, but at five foot 10, I'm out of headroom in this back row. Oh, it is nicely equipped, uh, some USB plugs, multiple multiple cup holders but interesting charging ports in the back only on this side for the third row oh, yeah put up the headrest or you're gonna get that right in the middle of your back there we go so i can't lean back to no, the headrest i yeah. feel like i'm at the dentist office <laughs> i can't lean my head back into this because i'm i'm gonna hit the ceiling here see and then the thing is if you want to fix it you got to turn right around and get into it yeah so really you're best to have these all set up before you get back here. Yeah. Uh, but again... Oh God, I, yeah, I can't close that with my knees. Ooh. Yeah, so you're gonna have some compli... <laughs> you're gonna definitely have some complications if you're trying to sit back here and, and you're not like, you know, um, half of our size. It's doable, but it's a little bit trickier uh, than it probably needs to be. It is just uh, a lift up on that lever on the side here and then I can push that out of the way pretty easily. But if you're using the third row in your crossover uh, for your smallest passengers, as most of us will, uh, then this should be just fine. All right, so that's a look at what you can expect from the Ascent's interior. I think many strengths and just a few weaknesses, most of which could be easily addressed on a future product update. But now it's time to see how this machine drives where it's mostly good news. From where I'm sitting, I think you'll see the Ascent's biggest strengths and weaknesses on a highway drive, which is where I spent over 800 kilometers with my tester. We'll come back to that. For now, I want to leave you with some comments about driving this machine on much rougher back road surfaces, which are far more than norm in my part of Northern Ontario, and this is a setting where I've come to expect very good things from Subaru SUVs over the years. And I'm happy to report that's largely the case here. Even with my tester rolling on the top line 20 inch wheels, 18s are standard by the way, I found fairly comfortable browsing of Sudbury's bashed up back roads and trails with a feeling of toughness and an overall ride that leans on the softer side for passenger comfort, while remaining consistently durable in terms of overall feel. It's not going for sporty, but if comfortable and solid and tough are more your cup of tea in the ride and handling department, I think you'll like the way this is dialed in. Over years of testing, I commonly find other Subaru crossovers to deliver a nicely tuned feel in the specific rough road settings that I commonly drive on. And while an Outback is softer and seems to make better use of a higher level of suspension travel on the very roughest roads, the Ascent manages to deliver above average ride comfort, even at a good clip, over some of the worst roads I drive on, with the ride quality being dialed in very nicely and minimal complaints, other than a little excessive noise and choppiness, over some fairly specific bumps. The suspension nicely resists unwanted body motions and rarely feels overwhelmed. The steering is nicely isolated too, no arguing required as the front wheels take a beating from the road. I tell you that if back roads ride quality is important to you, or if you're finding the crossover SUVs you're test driving to feel a bit too stiff and sporty, be sure to get some seat time in one of these and remember that opting for a lower end model with the 18 inch wheels will put even more rubber between you and the potholes, further softening the ride. 
Still, the Mazda CX-90 is a sportier choice for overall feel, though you will lose some ride comfort on those rough roads. And I'd tell you the ride and suspension on the Ascent feel a little more composed and stable overall than the Honda Pilot Trail Sport when driving here. And in the past year or so, my favorite SUVs on the very roughest roads when it comes to all-out comfort have been the Toyota Grand Highlander and Hyundai Palisade, but the Ascent isn't too far off. The 2.4-liter flat-four boxer turbo engine gives you plenty of low-rev torque that stays on strong as the revs climb. It doesn't get spinning that fast when working hard, but the power curve is very thick from just off idle to just under redline. And there's that flat-four growl from inside that's smooth and pleasing when you find occasion to put your foot down. By the numbers, it's 260 horsepower and 277 pounds of torque. Don't miss the top mount intercooler to keep boost temperatures reasonable, complete with that hood mounted duct that flushes the intercooler with cool outside air while you're driving to keep the boost nice and cool the way the engine likes it. Working with a continuously variable transmission, CVT, everything this powertrain does is tuned to be smooth and gentle, right down to the simulated gear shifts of the transmission at heavy throttle while passing and merging. Press hard on the accelerator and there's a good sensation of kick down, a satisfying blast of engine sound, a solid shove into your seat from low revs that swells slightly as the tachometer climbs, and simulated upshifts along the way. These are slow and soft, and the Ascent is not a neck snapper by any means. I think there are just enough sporty signals to satisfy the odd full throttle blast for the enthusiast driver, but really this powertrain is doing its best work in light throttle, low rev situations, and light footed drivers will find themselves up to highway speed quickly and smoothly without hearing much of anything or breaking 2000 rpm. On long drives, it's easy to appreciate how this smooths the powertrain out on hilly terrain, or in areas with frequent speed limit changes, and also how it keeps engine sound and fuel use down, especially if you're not in a rush. There's plenty of highway cruising range here. But there are a few complaints too, mainly the steering. This is my third time driving the Ascent, and the third time I would tell you I wish things felt a little more precise at the wheel. I wished for a little more feedback, a little more weight to the steering effort, and maybe a slightly faster ratio that I think would better match the Ascent's relatively confident handling. On the highway, and especially on windy days, I did find myself working a little harder than I'm used to to keep the vehicle centered between its lines, and while I enjoyed the powertrain, ride comfort, and handling manners, I just think the steering could use a little polish to bring it in line with the rest of the drive. No complaints from the brakes though, they're on the ball with a sharp, precise action, good feel, and strong bite from a light press. They're easy to modulate too, and even if the sand-covered roads we're stopping on here prevent the ascent from pulling off a really impressive looking stop, I ultimately appreciated how the brakes respond fast, and inspired confidence and controllability very quickly. These are attributes I typically expect in pricier machines. So with good brake feel, a strong safety story, X modes calling the shots for enhanced traction on challenging surfaces, and an overall ride that feels secure and durable, I think shoppers can expect a drive that stands up well to rough roads, forms a solid foundation for relaxing road tripping, and should leave most drivers and their families with a comfortable and easygoing place to unwind and socialize on the open road.